I'm Natasha Kierczek, and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, new violence erupts in the West Bank. The Israeli government shelves a controversial bill a day before the final vote. And prepare yourselves for a cuteness overload. Six celebrity dogs have just gotten an all-expense-paid puppy vacay right here in the Holy Land. Stay tuned for the latest news in Israel. New clashes have just erupted in the West Bank between Israelis and Palestinians. This is the same spot where just days ago a Palestinian man was shot and killed by an Israeli guard who says he acted in self-defense when Palestinians allegedly attacked a group of Israeli hikers. Things are clearly heating up and we've just learned that another Palestinian man has just been shot. A group of extreme right-wing Israelis purposely entered the Area A a second time, which the army has sealed off as a closed military zone in response to that previous incident. It's unclear how the violence flared up this time. What we do know is that a second Palestinian has been shot in the clashes and is in critical condition. No Israeli injuries have been reported. Meanwhile, police have confirmed that two suspects have been arrested on suspicion of murdering 19-year-old IDF soldier Ron Yitzhak Kokia. Kokia was brutally stabbed to death at a bus stop in the city of Arad. The Shin Bet says the terrorists are Israeli Bedouins who acted out of nationalistic motives. Sergeant Kokia was laid to rest earlier this week at a funeral attended by hundreds. Well, today is President Trump's final deadline on whether to officially move the U.S. Embassy in Israel to Jerusalem or to sign the waiver that keeps it in Tel Aviv for another six months. Jared Kushner has just spoken in Washington, D.C. alongside Israeli business mogul Chaim Saban. But it looks like even Trump's son-in-law and most senior advisor doesn't know what the final word will be. What I'll say is, is that the president's going to make his decision and... Uh, and, um, with he hasn't the, made his decision? Uh, he's still uh, looking at a lot of different facts and that mm. when he makes his decision, uh, he'll be the one to want to tell you, not me. So, uh, so he'll, he'll, he'll make sure he does that at the right time. Many Israelis have been pushing for the U.S. to move the embassy to Jerusalem for years now, thus formally recognizing Jerusalem as Israel's capital. The Palestinians, however, who also claim sovereignty over the holy city, say such a move would completely destroy chances for Middle East peace. In a last-ditch effort to prevent the embassy move, both the Arab League and Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas have denounced the possibility, saying any move or even recognition would be a threat to the future of the peace process and is unacceptable for the Palestinians, Arabs, and internationally. Even if the embassy isn't moved to Jerusalem, word is that Trump may still officially decide to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. The Palestinians have promised Kushner that such a statement would bring Trump's efforts for Israeli-Palestinian peace to a complete and total end. Violence is expected to surge if Trump ultimately goes through with it. American embassies throughout the Middle East have reportedly been warned to brace for potential unrest. With the deadline literally ticking away, we'll just have to wait and see. Well, in a shocking move, the controversial recommendations bill, which would block police from suggesting criminal indictments to the attorney general, has been nixed from today's final vote. This comes a mere 20 hours before the Knesset was set for the last and decisive read-through. ILTV's Aaron Porras is here to explain. Now, Aaron, what happened? In short, Prime Minister Netanyahu happened. He asked for the bill to respect the wishes of the people, which asked for, uh, for his the indictments against him, not the indictments, the investigations against mm -hmm. him to be removed from the bill, to, to not be included. Right. He himself actually previously asked for a very similar thing. And now it seems that until that bill is going to be rewritten, it's been removed from the right. list. Now, you said that Netanyahu um, has asked for this before. Mm -hmm. If so, why is it only being rewritten right now? It's a difficult thing to answer because, unfortunately, there's not really any sort of clear response to that. What we do know is that David Bitan and David Amsalem, the two co-sponsors of the bill, have been pushing hard for this bill to apply mm -hmm. to everything. Uh, even in the, in the committee in which David Amsalem actually heads, which oversaw the drafting of the bill and the pushing of it through, the, uh, Likud MK Benny Begin actually said, okay, let's make sure that this does not apply to the investigations yeah. against Netanyahu. And Begin was actually removed from that committee and replaced with David Bitan, the other co-sponsor of the bill. 
and and that just raised where way more awareness about you know uh, corruption and things like that. A lot, a lot of red flags right, kind of went up after that. Be good for Netanyahu. Exactly. So one of two things is either happening: either Netanyahu is doubling down and actually getting really serious with his request to remove that portion from the bill, or he, uh, or or he's just reiterating how serious he is about that and and forcing their hand. But I'll tell you more in my report right now. This about face comes after weeks of intense debate, opposition, and even mass protest against the legislation. That's because critics see it as an obvious attempt to protect Prime Minister Netanyahu, who is currently at the center of two police probes for alleged corruption. Proponents for the bill, however, say the bill would protect Israeli citizens from public fallout, who are eventually found innocent in court. But now Netanyahu himself is bringing things to a standstill and asking the bill to be rewritten, specifically so that it excludes his current investigations from the law. Fellow Likud lawmaker David Amsalem, who's been spearheading this bill, is blaming what he believes are, quote, violent left-wing Knesset members for the bill's stall. An estimated 20,000 demonstrators rallied in Tel Aviv this weekend, picketing against this bill, so clearly it looks like their cries have been heard. The New York Times is under fire for painting what some called a rather gentle portrait of a neo-Nazi. But now that the man and his wife have been fired from their jobs and forced to move cities, white supremacists are apparently sympathetic to their situation and are taking action through a crowdsourcing site called Goy Fund Me. LTV's Brett Allen Smith has the details. And, and Brett, is Goy Fund Me actually what I think it is? Ridiculous. Uh, yes, Natasha, I have a feeling it is. Uh, so playing off the popular crowdfunding site GoFundMe, GoyFundMe is a similar platform for raising money on the web, except that it doesn't censor white supremacist or otherwise anti-Semitic content. And that's basically what this new campaign falls under. Because dozens of strangers have just donated nearly $10,000 to this man, Tony Hobbiter, and his wife when they were fired from their jobs after being revealed by the New York Times as Nazi sympathizers. Well, that Times article has actually been generating a lot of heat lately. Sure. People have accused it of being way, way too soft on a neo-Nazi. I mean, it actually praised the man's good manners, right? Correct. And, you, I mean, you're absolutely right. It's made a lot of people very upset because they feel it kind of normalizes Hobeter and some of his most extreme neo-Nazi views. Now, the Times has responded by saying the piece was only meant to shed light on this corner of society, not necessarily, you know, challenge it or defeat it. But now that the sympathy is coming in the form of actual money and 10 grand isn't a number to laugh at mm -hmm. here, I think that's where the debate starts to get a little bit blurry, as you'll see now in my report. Sympathies for Tony Hoviter, co-founder of the neo-Nazi group the Traditionalist Worker Party, are now taking the form of cold, hard cash. That's because Hoviter and his wife were fired from their jobs earlier this week following a profile in the New York Times exploring Hoviter's extreme Nazi sympathies including his claim that Hitler was, quote, chill when it came down to the massacring of Jews in the Holocaust. But for many, the Times piece seemed less focused on challenging these controversial views in favor of praising Hoviter's charming personality. The Times wrote that his so-called Midwestern manners would even, quote, please anyone's mother, end quote. The New York Times says the piece was merely intended to paint complete portraits of members of America's extreme alt-right movement, but now that these sympathies have led to nearly 10 grand in donations, many are wondering where exactly to draw the line. Over 10% of Israelis face significant food insecurity, meaning their financial distress causes their families to frequently lack food. Joining us now in the studio is Goldie Sternbuch, the Director of Overseas Relations for Meir Panim, an organization that is combating this very issue. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, first, Goldie, I'd like you to give us, uh, you know, some background and statistics as, as to the hunger, hunger and poverty that uh, many are facing here in Israel. So Israel is a, a country with 8.5 million people. Yes. Uh, the official statistics, uh, which came out at the end of 2016, uh, point to a very problematic number in terms of poverty and social isolation. Uh, we speak about 8.5 million citizens, of which... Um, I have 460,800 families living below the line of poverty. Wow. 1.7 and some million adults living below the line of poverty. 764,000 kids, which is almost a million children. That is a crazy number. When you think that it's a country of 8.5 million. It's, when we yeah. think that it's a country of 8.5 yeah. million and when we think that it's a country which does so well for itself. Mm -hmm. we, we export defense, medicine, agriculture, yeah. high tech. How I could mean, this be the case? And people come to us and say, that's not the Israel that we know. Mm -hmm. We know hotels, we know beaches, we know great food. 
So this is the Israel that we know, unfortunately. So, so what does Meir Panim do to address these issues? So Meir Panim was originally set up to combat food insecurity. This was way back in 2000. It was supposed to be a very small, unambitious family-run project. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, terror hit in 2001. Um, terrorism was up, tourism was down, the economy took a big, big bad hit. And today, 17 and some years later, uh, we feed close to 2,000 people every day. Wow. But um, as we evolved with time, we realized that food is very important. We all need to eat every single day. Nutritious, hot food, which we serve at our restaurants. You can see the pictures. And these are free restaurants for people in need, essentially, These right? are free restaurants. And anyone can come in. You and I can walk in, and people always ask us if anybody is invited, then... People must be taking yeah. advantage of your service. Well, absolutely. And I mean, it's not, people have this image in their head of who would be uh, going to these restaurants, but uh, there are people of all backgrounds, Olim Khadashim, who have it rough when they come here. There's really kind of a, a wide range of people who are, are using the your services. Is, is so enormous. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you and I, when we're hungry, we don't walk into a soup kitchen because yeah. we know that there's food waiting. Right. So people who come are either physically in need, sometimes emotionally in need, sometimes socially in need. So we're running out of time, but I, I obviously want to talk about kind of the wider issue here. What needs to happen right now to ensure that the numbers that you're telling us about do not grow? How do we help um, the existing people right now who are dealing with um, this food insecurity overcome these challenges in the future? Well, it's a very good question. How do we help those who are already mm -hmm. inside that cycle of poverty and make sure that this doesn't grow wider? Right. So what we've come to realize is that education is key here. Uh, we need to help the next generation and the generation after that. Um, and, and the ultimate idea is to make sure that the children of the next generation, because if you think about it, Israel relies on its human resources, okay, mm -hmm. for all the reasons that we stated earlier. And if in 2017 we have close to 800,000 kids living below the line of poverty, what does that bode for the next generation, yeah. for our leaders of you know, the next 15 <laughs> years? So there's so much to be said and so little time, um, but education Edu is key. We okay. have very, very, we invest a lot of money and a lot of thought uh, with a lot of professional help into educational programs. We run after-school clubs, which are way more than just babysitting. There is a lot of therapies going on there. We partner with the IDF. We bring them role models from the army, from colleges, from university. We have the police force involved. We have um, MDA involved. We have the army. Yeah, I mentioned the army. So. Mm -hmm. Very well, well, I mean, education, like you said, is key. And for those of our viewers who are interested in learning more about your organization, perhaps volunteering, um, they should check oh, out your sure. website, right? They'll, they'll meet May volunteers from all over the world. Check our website. All right, There's Goldie. Well, thank you so much for coming you, in and Natasha. telling us about this very important issue. Thanks. All right. Well, Israeli gamers and non-gamers alike are outraged over the fact that a video game in which the player hunts down Nazis has been blocked from the Israeli market. The game's publisher has issued no statement on why they won't release it in Israel, which is strange, given the fact that they censored images of swastikas and Hitler's mustache in order to secure a release in Germany. My brothers and sisters of the United States of America, tonight we, the free people of the resistance, ask you to become one of us. This isn't the first time the creators of the hit Wolfenstein video game series have come under controversy. This new game, Wolfenstein 2 The New Colossus, takes gamers into an alternate past in which the Nazis won the war and tasks players with hunting down enemy steampunk Nazis to stop them from world domination. Israeli gamers and developers, however, have condemned the game's developer for not trying to get an Israeli release. Apparently, the game wasn't even submitted to the Israeli censorship board. The game was heavily censored to remove Nazi imagery at the request of German censors, an act which drove Israeli developers to make a parody version of the game called Wolfenstash, the new censorship, a way of making fun of all the imagery banned in Germany. They also point out the hypocrisy of the ban, saying, quote, When you're not selling your game in Israel because we're Jews, you're doing it wrong. You can be proud of your game in every game store around the world, but so ashamed of it in Israel you won't even sell it to us? Despite the ban in Israel, Wolfenstein 2 is available for sale in almost every other video game market. Organizers of Germany's biggest beauty competition thought this year's candidate might be the first ever Jewish Miss Germany. But as it turns out, there actually was already a Jewish Miss Germany. And the reason we didn't know about it until now, well, because the winner was afraid her Jewish heritage 
might make her a target for anti-Semitism, so she kept it a secret. Valeria Bistritskaya won the Miss Universe Germany pageant back in 2011. She immigrated to Germany from Russia to escape anti-Semitism in the 90s, which is why her mother warned her never to reveal her Jewish roots. She kept the secret hidden for years, even when she competed in the Miss Universe Germany competition. But after she won the pageant, somehow her secret got out and she was immediately attacked on social media with anti-Semitic slurs. That's when Miss Germany realized she could no longer live in Germany as a Jew and moved to America after her reign ended. She still models in the U.S. and last year she even had a nice Jewish wedding in Colorado, much to her mother's joy. Well, there are few technologies that have been able to baffle the world as much as Bitcoin. This digital currency or cryptocurrency is changing the way we deal with money and its value is rising enormously. Joining us in the studio now is Uriel Pellet, the co-founder of Cointree Capital, to tell us all about cryptocurrency and why we may want to invest in it, right? Mm -hmm. Uriel, thank you for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. So, so give us some background um, about what, it, what is cryptocurrency? This is kind of a very confusing term for many people. They just don't know what it is. Yeah. So um, Bitcoin is basically uh, a digital coin. It's a, a new form of money. And maybe the biggest difference between Bitcoin and regular money is that it is not controlled by any centralized entity. Right, no it banks. It is not, no. not controlled by governments, it is not controlled by banks, and basically it enables you to do anything you can do with regular money just without a bank. So I can hold my own money and I can send it everywhere in the world. Now why, would you, why wouldn't you want the bank to be involved? Um, because um, using Bitcoin you can, do, you can transfer money uh, much quicker with almost no fees and with maximum security. So let's right. say you want to pass, I don't know, $1,000 from Israel to China. I don't know, even know how to do it using banks. You need to open a bank account in China. Fees. There are fees. It takes weeks. With Bitcoin, you can do it in 10 seconds. Instantaneously, yeah, instantaneous. it's absolutely crazy. Okay, so, and blockchain technology, also tell us a little bit about that terminology before we get into what your company does, because that's also another kind of confusing. Yeah. Um, so blockchain is basically the technology behind Bitcoin. Okay. It is basically a ledger. So what is a ledger? A ledger is like the, the balance that we have in the bank account. It says who transfer the money from which address to which address. So I moved $5 from my account to your account. So this is basically a ledger. A blockchain is a decentralized ledger. It okay. means that it doesn't uh, sit in any centralized computer. Instead, it sits in thousands of computers like the internet all over the world and not in one place. Very so basically, the, the cloud manages the bank accounts of um, millions of people. Very interesting. Okay, so, so what does your company do specifically? Israel is actually a leader in this industry, but and your company is doing something very interesting. Um, so we have three different activities in country. We have a hedge fund that invests in mm -hmm. digital currencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum. There are 1,000 different uh, digital... Right, there's not just Bitcoin, even though that's what everybody yeah. hears about. There are a lot of other currencies. So Bitcoin was the first, but now there are many new mm -hmm. innovations and new kind of coins. So we invest in them. Uh, we have activity to advise new companies that want to enter the space, create their own coins for different use cases. And we also have a technology venture to create the next generation of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin has some troubles. It is a bit slow. It's not fitted yet to, for mainstream usage. So we want to generate a new Bitcoin that can be fast and used by the, the mainstream. Well, the Bitcoin that exists right now, um, its value went up enormously in the last couple of months. I think ten, its value is more than $10,000. Today, I think it's $11,000. Which is crazy. So, I mean, there are a lot of people who became millionaires from simply investing in this back in 2009, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when, when Bitcoin had just started, right? So, so what is your advice to people like myself, you know, who are interested in this but don't necessarily understand it, what, where sh what they, should they be doing? So Make me a millionaire. Yeah, so I, I can't give any investment advices, but I think that everyone should buy some Bitcoin and hold it for a very long time, like five years. And either it will go up enormously, or maybe it will just you know, die and, and end the bubble. I think there are two um, opinions in the world. Either it's going to replace the world, uh, gold, sorry, mm -hmm. and even if 1% of the money that is now invested in gold will move to Bitcoin, then Bitcoin will, can be even $1 million. On the other hand, maybe it's a bubble. No one can really explain the underlying you know, value behind Bitcoin, so it can either go down. So my advice is buy some Bitcoin, hold it for a very long time. And see either it's going to change the world or, or not. 
<laughs> and maybe it will change your own bank account, right? Yeah. All right. Well, Uriel, thank you so much for joining us and telling us about what your company does. For those who are interested in learning more about investing in cryptocurrency, uh, Cointree Capital is the place to go, right? Yeah. All right. Okay, my friends, here comes your daily dose, or should I say overdose, of all things cute and fluffy. Six celebrity pups have just been treated to their very own doggy vacay right here in the Holy Land after winning a contest on social media. Oh, and their owners got to come along too, so brace yourself for maximum adorableness right now. First off, let me introduce you to the lucky tail wagging winners. There's Yayush and Renzo, the Chihuahuas, Bruce Wayne of the world famous Instagram I Party with Bruce Wayne, Iggy Joey, whose owner says he's half kangaroo and half deer, and that pup with the killer fro, well, that's Teddy the Mini Poodle, and last but certainly not least is Remix, the hipster dog from Miami. These lucky pooches just got treated to an all expense paid first class tour of Israel from the beaches of Tel Aviv all the way to the holy sight sounds and smells of Jerusalem. Vibe Israel opened the contest to all dog owners with a heavy social media following in hopes of bringing a fresh and exciting new audience to the Holy Land for the first time. And by the look of all these wagging tails, clearly the PR campaign was a massive success. And hey, even their owners got thrown a bone or two. Oh, what a glorious time to be a dog. An Israeli bride and groom were on the way to their wedding when suddenly their car broke down, stranding them on the side of the highway. But what could have been the worst wedding day ever was saved when a highway patrolman swooped in and personally raced them to the altar himself. Talk about a story to tell your kids someday. The patrolman arrived on the scene and quickly realized that the couple's car was broken down beyond immediate repair. But this is Israel, my friends, and nothing gets in the way of an Israeli wedding, and that's why the patrolman radioed in and requested permission to leave his post, taking the bride and groom-to-be to their chupa just in time. He even decorated his patrol car with makeshift wedding decorations on the spot to honor their beautiful day. I don't know about you, but i definitely take that over a boring old wedding, wedding limo anytime. The Jerusalem International Dance Week has officially begun, but it looks like it's coming with some creative constraints from the government. ILTV's Emmanuel Kadosh is here to give us some more details. Hi, Natasha. Yes, the event has already begun and is showcasing local and international dancers. But there's been a bit of controversy because some of this year's acts include nudity in their performance. Israel's cultural culture ministry and the Jerusalem municipality have spoken to the city's dance center and made it very clear that there are no way supporting performances with nudity. So what's going to happen here? Will those performances still continue with nudity and could that jeopardize the event's funding from the Ministry of Culture? Well, the word is that the center's co-founder Ruby Edelman has just been told by the ministry that they have to single out any performances that feature nudity mm -hmm. in advance. And get this, in the program itself, they have to write specifically that these dances are not supported by the Ministry of Culture. The Jerusalem municipality actually backed that message and asked for their non-support to be listed where needed as well. But other than that, the show must go on now that Machol, Machol Shalem Dance Center gets about 500,000 shekels or $143,000 from the ministry to fund this event. And it looks like as long as they stick with these requirements, that money is not going anywhere. Now, imagine, I mean, I imagine Cultural Minister Miri Regev had something to say about all of this. She's, um, of course, been very vocal about nudity versus modesty in the past. This isn't the first time. Right. Well, as you would expect, Regev is very much against these performances. She's very clear and said that, quote, a performance in full nudity, even under the cover of art, is contrary and detrimental to the basic values of Israeli public and Israel as a Jewish and democratic state and hurts the feelings of the wider public. Now, like many, I can't say I personally agree with her viewpoint, but she, of course, believes she needs to look out for the public's interests. Well, that's exactly why the debate of artistic expression is so important. But at the end of the day, I know that I'm just excited to see some amazing dancing at Dance Week. Thanks for the scoop, Emmanuel. Thanks. And now for our Hebrew word of the day. In my humble opinion, there's nothing more important in life than your pet. I mean, your family. Well, a pet is also a part of your family. So on that note, today's word is Chayat Mahmad, which means pet in Hebrew. Now, the direct translation of Chayat Mahmad is allowed life, which honestly is kind of dark. A pet is allowed in a human's home, therefore that pet is allowed to live. That's messed up. I wish that people would view all animals like they view their own pets, beloved and important. After all, I see my Chayat Mahmad as a bundle of love and that just happens to be wrapped in fur. 
All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. Tonight will be clear and dry with a slight rise in temperatures to a minimum of 58 or 14 degrees Celsius. Tomorrow is expected to be partly cloudy and with a drop in temperatures, the high is supposed to sit around 74 or 23 degrees Celsius. All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.49 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.TV. I'm Natasha Kirchuk, and thanks for watching.